it's my pleasure to host this uh, this event. Uh, growing up in science, so what are we about? We're about the personal stories of the people who are doing science and who are working at uh, at our universities. So we uh, we want to have a space where people can share what it's like to be a scientist. And uh, not only all the stuff that you put on your CV, you know, all of the grants that you got and all of the successes, but also all of the inevitable disappointments and the struggles and work-life balance and all these things uh, uh, are open for discussion over here. Um, so uh, today we have uh, with us uh, David Ragsdale. Thank you for coming. Uh, David is, uh, uh, when I first invited him, uh, David said, oh, like, my uh, my my uh, background or my career is not very typical for for people at in academia, uh, and I immediately said, "Well, great! That's exactly why we want to hear uh, you as well, because we want to see how many different ways there are to work in academia and to do beautiful things uh, and meaningful things uh, for people uh, across the world." Um, so. Um, the format today is uh, I'll first uh, give the floor to, to David to um, introduce himself and like, tell a bit about, about yourself. Uh, and uh, then I will try to hold back on all the many questions that I have. And uh, then we'll have uh, like a more interactive part uh, where um, we'd be trying to go deeper into, uh, into David and uh, what he is about. Uh, and uh, we also have the opportunity for the audience to ask questions uh, and uh, to also for the people who are following online. Thank you for being here too. Uh, for you as well, uh, if you feel like interacting, you have a question or you want to share something, feel free to post that in the chat. We have a marvelous tech team here who is uh, monitoring that as we speak. So they'll be able to then inform us of what is being said and we merge it into the discussion. So uh, David Ragsdale, just briefly, uh, David was uh, trained at University of Illinois, I think, University of California and University of Washington. <laughs> so lots of different places. And uh, wonderfully for us, he ended up here, uh, let's say at uh, McGill, he was director of the uh, integrated program in neuroscience, I think, an interdisciplinary program uh, for people uh, doing the stuff that we do. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he focuses uh, a lot on teaching excellence and uh, on best practices in teaching. He's received numerous awards that like, I don't even start to list them all, uh, including uh, some very prestigious ones from the, uh, from the Canadian Medical Association, I believe, and, uh, and many others. You can find all this information, of course, uh, on his website. Uh, so I won't distract us from actually hearing David speak. So David, okay. um, please take yeah. a moment. So, um... So thanks, thanks for that introduction, Floris. And and uh, I'm sort of speaking to everybody here online and so forth. I, I think what I'd like to do is um, I, I, just to, as briefly as possible, kind of tell you my story, right? How I got here, sitting in this chair Great. right now. And I think that you're. I I I, uh, I agree with what you said that I think that the path that I've taken is um, ended up in a little bit of a different place than many of the speakers that have participated in this um, in this series. And um, maybe there's something to be learned from that. I think that there are, you know, in the course of kind of trying to describe how I got here, I think when I reflect back on it, there are a few, uh, maybe a few lessons that I learned in retrospect, things that maybe I, I might have thought about a little bit more in the course of progressing through my career. And so not that I regret where I've ended up, but in, in, in sometimes when I think back on it, I think, well, maybe there are some things that I wish I'd kind of thought of, things I wish I knew, or things I wish I had thought of at the time. So I'll, uh, I'm going to start back at the beginning, right? Um, and as you indicated, I was an undergraduate student at, at the University of Illinois, which is in um, in Champaign-Urbana. So the um, uh, University of Illinois is a very large university. It's bigger than McGill, bigger than the University of Montreal, I think. Now it probably has 50,000 students. When I was there, it probably had 40,000 students. Um, but it's a university like many Midwestern universities in the United States. It's in the middle of nowhere. So it's this huge university uh, in a town of about 40,000 people in the middle of nowhere in central Illinois. And um, when I when I started University of Illinois, so there's, there's a point to that, but I'll get to that in a minute. But when I started at the University of Illinois, um, I was very interested in science. I was interested in all kinds of science. All my life, I've been reading about astronomy and biology and, and uh, all kinds of different science. And I thought, you know, some kind of scientific uh, 
pursuit, academic pursuit, would interest me. But when I got to the University of Illinois, I, I, was, uh, um, I was a bit intimidated, a bit overwhelmed by, by, there, I, by being there. I wasn't sure that I really belonged there. I wasn't sure that I was really smart enough or competent enough to actually excel. So I kind of was afraid to pursue some of the scientific domains that I thought would be too difficult, right? I, I thought, well, you know, I'm very interested in chemistry, but chemistry is going to be too hard. And I'm interested in physics, but physics is going to be too hard. Um, uh, but I took some psych psychology courses and I thought, well, these are really interesting courses. Um, and, and, and so this was straight psychology. You know, I took an abnormal psychology course and an introduction to psychology course and courses like that. And I thought, well, th this is really interesting. And as I understand it, I wanted to take any differential equations or anything to, to pursue this, this, uh, this, um, academic discipline, right? Well, I was very mistaken to think that to be a psychologist, you don't need to understand anything about mathematics. Of course, you need to understand a lot about statistics, but I didn't know that at the time. So I started taking these psychology courses. And one of the courses that I took was a course called Physiological Psychology, right? Now, you might ask yourself, if you're a student now, you might ask yourself, well, what is physiological psychology? Physiological psychology is neuroscience because at the time the term neuroscience really didn't exist. I mean, this wasn't that long ago. We're talking about maybe the late 1970s, right? But at the time, that term really it, it wasn't a term that people used to describe investigating the biology of the brain. So I took this course in physiological psychology, and I thought, well, that's something really interesting. So I took a few more courses related to that, and ultimately got a degree in psychology. Well, now I was I was a, a, a 23 year old with an undergraduate degree in psychology. And I had no idea what I was going to do with that. But I managed to get a job working as a technician in a lab at the University of Illinois that studied learning and memory. So this was a lab that was run by a guy named Michael Gabriel. And, and what, uh, what Professor Gabriel did is he studied um, learning in rabbits. So the, the way that the what, what he did was he implanted chronically implanted they chronically implanted electrodes in various regions of, of the cortex in rabbits, and then they trained the rabbits uh, in a, a, a sort of a learning paradigm where they put the rabbits in a big, great big running wheel. These enormous white rabbits, right, and they put them stuffed them into this running wheel, and then the rabbits would hear two tones: a high pitched tone or a low pitched tone. If they heard the high pitched one of the tones, nothing would happen. If they heard the other tone and they didn't turn the running wheel, they'd get a foot shock. And so the rabbits would gradually learn when they heard one of the tones to turn the running wheel. And then they would record from these different brain regions while the rabbits learned this. And so I was the technician in the lab. And as the technician, I had all the terrible, horrible jobs, right? So for example, um, when the rabbits were first put in the running wheel, they didn't know that one of the tones was going to be associated with the foot shock. So when they heard the tone, they would just sit there and then they'd get a foot shock. And when they get a foot shock, the first thing that the rabbit would do is to pee all over the running wheel, right? They, an enormous amount of pee would come out and all over the running wheel. Well, when that happens, then the little bar, metal bars on the running wheel now were short circuited so the rabbit wouldn't get a foot shock anymore. So somebody had to go and pull the rabbit out, clean up the pee, clean it up from all the little uh, you know, metal slats uh, between in the running wheel and then put the rabbit back in so that was the kind of things that i did so it, it wasn't i didn't really like this job very much but it it enabled me it was sort of a a, a wedge into doing neuroscience research so i worked in this lab for a year and a half now i had some some uh laboratory experience and um so i decided at that point well you know again i was still confused about what i wanted to do where i wanted to go but i thought uh, I think maybe I'll go to graduate school. And I, I think, you know, like a lot of perhaps some of the people listening. Uh, not necessarily state without the inversion. Um, they just mute all the participants. That's okay. Yeah. No, it happens all the time. It's, it, it does. But so, um, like many, I think, like many students who, who are confronted with this kind of decision, I decided I wanted to go to graduate school um, because I, the only thing I knew how to do was to go to school, right? I'd been going to school for, for 20 years or 16 years. And so I said, well, I'm just gonna continue going to school because this seems like something I'm good at. But the second thing, so that was the first thing. The second thing is that I, I decided that the one thing I definitely wanted to do was I wanted to leave 
central Illinois and go someplace warm. And once I was in someplace warm, I was never coming back. I was never going back to a cold climate again for the rest of my life, right? So that's very ironic, of course. But so I applied, I applied, and this is like, you know, part of the life lesson, I'll everything kind of swing circles back around. So I applied to every single school in Southern California. And I got accepted at a school called University of California, Irvine, which uh, again, and, and the program I was accepted into was a program called psychobiology. Now, once again, you might ask yourself, well, what's psychobiology? It's neuroscience. But again, the, the term neuroscience didn't exist. In fact, the psychobiology department was one of the first neuroscience programs in North America, but it was called psychobiology. And when they eventually changed their name, they're now called like the, the neuroscience program of University of California, Irvine. A lot of the old timers are very upset about this because they said, you know, we coined this term psychobiology and we don't want to give up on it. But it was a good program. It had a lot of very good people in it. And it had a lot of people who were very well known in, in the neurobiology of learning and memory. So I told my supervisor, my, my boss, because I was working as a technician, I said, well, I got into this uh, program at the University of California, Irvine. He said, fantastic. That's a great program. There's a whole bunch of great people there. But the way that this program worked, it was a PhD program. And the way that this program worked was that you were accepted into the program. So there was a committee that, say, selected eight students each year that would get accepted into the program. And then they would assign you to a lab. So you didn't, it wasn't like, for example, at McGill, I don't know what it's like here at the University of Montreal, but at McGill, it's more of an apprenticeship kind of a system where you get connected to a supervisor and, and you get accepted into the program to work with that person, right? But there it was more like, uh, you know, some schools have rotation programs, but this was more like you were accepted into the program, you were assigned a supervisor based, they were tried to assign us based on supervisor needs and based on student interests. And the premise was, well, if, you, if this doesn't work out, you can always change, you can always switch labs. But I mean, I, I'm not the kind of person who'd walk up to, to my supervisor at the age of 24 and say, well, you know, I worked with you for six months, but I got to tell you it's not working out. You know, I'm going to switch someplace else. So that wasn't going to happen. And I got assigned to a lab. Uh, and the lab, the, the supervisor of the lab was a guy named Ricardo Milady. So I went to my boss, the technician, my, I mean, my, my boss where I was working as a technician. And I said, well, I got assigned to this lab by this, and the guy's name is Ricardo Milady. And my, my boss looked at him and he said, Ricardo Milady, never heard of the guy. This, this is, he says, no, 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 no. He says, you got to go, and you know, there's these other guys there. And you got to go, you got you to call them up and you got to tell them that this isn't going to work out. I want to work with, you know, Gary Lynch. I want to work with or Jim McGar or something like that. You don't want to work with this person. I don't know who he is. So, um, I said, okay, well, you know. so I went and looked up Ricardo Milady's CV. And of course, back then, you couldn't look it up on the internet, but I managed to look it up. And he had something like 250 publications. And they were in all these famous science publications and nature publications, all of these things. But I had no idea who this guy was, not a clue. Um, well, it turned out he was actually quite a famous scientist. And he was someone who, Milady was a guy who worked with another scientist named Bernard Katz. You might have heard of Bernard Katz. So Bernard Katz worked with Hodgkin and Huxley, and Bernard Katz was played a seminal role in uh, our understanding of synaptic function, you know, uh, so really kind of a, a foundational role in, in our understanding of synaptic physiology. And he won the Nobel Prize in uh, like 1962. So Ricardo Malady didn't win the Nobel Prize, but he was Bernard Katz's, you know, um, co-investigator in many, many, many publications. So there are many, many cats and related publications. And the main thing that they were, one of the main things that they were famous for is that they really worked out the, the role of calcium in, in neurotransmitter in synaptic transmission. The idea that calcium influx into the presynaptic terminal is required for the release of neurotransmitter. They played a seminal role in working that out. Of course, I didn't know any of this at the time. But so this guy was a classical, physiologist, right? So he, he wasn't, he, he, had, he had just come to the University of California, Irvine from University College London. So I was his first graduate student at, at uh, Irvine. And, um, and he wasn't, he wasn't really uh, a psychobiologist like many of the, uh, many of the investigators at Irvine were. He was more of a classic classical physiologist, right? So he'd done work on like squid axon and squid synapse and things like that. So when I got to his lab, um, 
what I, he I you know he he was a very nice person and 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 we talked about projects and it turned out that that he had just he was one of the people who had just developed this what was at the time a very new technique which some of you might be familiar with and the technique involved taking what at that time what they did is they took messenger RNA so they would isolate messenger RNA and inject it into frog oocytes, xenopus oocytes. So you might be familiar, some of you might be familiar with this, with this system. So this is a system, an expression system, right? And um, so xenopus frogs, um, they, they are, have been used for many, many years in, in physiology. And what the way that these experiments work is that they would take the oocytes out of the frog. So oocytes are immature egg cells. They take the oocytes out and you, they, they, they're enormous cells, right? So these are single cells and they're a millimeter in diameter. You can take these cells and you, turns out what they, what they discovered is, not surprisingly, so that they initially did this with messenger RNA from a fish called torpedo. So torpedo is an electric fish, right? And it's, it's a ray fish and it has these electric organs that can generate very large voltages. Like if you grab a hold of one, you're gonna get a nasty shock, right? And they do this because these electric organs are basically almost nothing but nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. The electric organ is just rows and rows and rows of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So what they would do is they took the electric organs, they ground them up, they isolated the messenger RNA, which is like 95% encoding nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and injected it into xenopasuicytes, and the oocytes would take the messenger RNA and they'd make functional receptors and put them on their membranes. And then they could study them using electrophysiological recording because uh, Ricardo Malady was really an electrophysiologist, right? And then they said, well, that's really great. So what if we take some messenger RNA from the brain and grind that up? So they did that, they grind it up and they extracted the messenger RNA and injected it into these oocytes. And the oocytes make all kinds of ion channels. They made ligand gated ion channels like uh, uh, GABA receptors and uh, and glutamate receptors, and they also made voltage-gated ion channels, voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels, and so forth and so on. And the, they just stick them all on the surface because the oocyte can't tell the difference between its own messenger RNA and the messenger RNA that's injected inside of it. So this was, at the time, a very new technique. Now it's, it's a sort of standard operating procedure for many kinds of the ion channel studies, and it's been sort of superseded by, by using uh, cultured cells. But at the time, this was a new technique, the technique for express, expressing ion channels in these cells and then studying the properties of the ion channels. And, 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 and Ricardo was one of the people who really developed this, this technique. So this was brand new at the time. So I got this project looking at, uh, at ligand-gated ion channels expressed, brain ligand-gated ion channels expressed in xenopus oocytes. Um, but so the point of this, where I'm getting at right now is, I got an undergraduate degree in psychology, but now I was studying, and, and that was because I was interested in the brain, right? How, what, what's going on in the brain and how's what's going on in the brain related to behavior or related to thinking, related to all these kinds of interesting things that the brain does. But now I was a graduate student uh, and I was um, uh, studying ion channels, right? I was studying voltage and light and gate and ion channels and I was using electrophysiology. So I said, okay, it sounds good to me, you know? I mean, I was just so thrilled to be there. I was just so excited to be in California. I was so excited to be a PhD student and I was so excited to be in this lab, which I was starting to get the feeling this was you know, gonna be an impressive lab to be in. Um, and so that was my project. And, uh, and you know, I worked on that project. Well, it, in, the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't turn out to be a very interesting project, but I managed to persevere and get a PhD. And, at near the end of my PhD, so the end of my PhD would have been around 1990, um, Ricardo sent me to a, a Gordon conference, which are these conferences in, in uh, New England, in the towns of New England. And this was a Gordon conference on, I think it was on probably the Iron Chance, most likely, I can't remember what it was. But at the conference, at the Gordon conference, I met a guy, we were, we were actually standing by a river skipping stones, right? And I started talking to the guy next to me. It, it, it turned out to be this guy named Bill Catterall. And I'd heard this guy's name before because, because the, he, they had been talking about him. I should go back and mention one other thing. I'll just say one other thing about, about Milady's lab. So this guy, Milady was very European. He's very, he was very continental, you know? And so the way the lab worked is we would come in in the morning and you maybe work for 
couple hours doing your experiments. And then we would have a coffee break. Like it was like tea time, right? Because he came from England, but we had coffee, but it was tea time. So we would go and we would have our tea time break. And that would start at 1030. And that would go on for an hour. You know, we would just sit there leisurely drinking our tea and, and our coffee and talking and talking and talking. And, and then we'd go back and they'd do a little bit more work and then it'd be lunchtime. So then they'd go off and they'd have lunch and the lunch would last for an hour. And then they'd come back from lunch and then they'd have more coffee. So we'd have another coffee break, right? <laughs> so then they would have more coffee. And then, so it was very kind of, you know what I mean? That it was very kind of leisurely. And it was also very sideways. Like there, there wasn't really a strong sense that we were all focused on specific goals. We were just sort of meandering around through our scientific endeavors, right? So that was kind of the plot in that, in that lab. But so when I was at, um, uh, I met uh, this guy, Bill Catterall, and uh, he was a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Now, all my life, I'd wanted to live in Seattle, Washington, not all my life, but all of my, you know, since I'd started. I mean, it was always kind of a fantasy thing. I always thought, oh, Seattle, Washington, what a place I'd love to live there. And when I was at the Gordon Conference, Catterall said, well, I'm looking for an electrophysiologist, and why don't you have your uh, Ricardo send me a letter and you know, kind of a reference letter, and we'll see what we can do. And so the next thing I knew, I had a postdoc position, which was great because I was finishing up my PhD, and now I had a postdoc, um, and, and I was going to be in Seattle, so I was just thrilled. I was just thrilled, and I also met my wife right before, we moved. so my, my, the woman who was going to be my wife and I, we moved out there, and it was very exciting. Now, Catterall, there, there, there's a point to this story, so Bill Catterall uh, um, had a huge lab, so he, in the time I was there, I was there for five years, and typically over that time, he typically had around 20 postdocs, right? And maybe five graduate students and maybe five technicians. So, and, and this huge sprawling lab spread out over multiple levels and, and uh, uh, buildings, and enormous building that we worked in. But the whole lab was dedicated to two proteins, the voltage-gated sodium channel, right? Which is propagates action potentials and voltage-gated calcium channels. So when I, when I moved up to Seattle and I discussed my project with Bill Catterall, we worked out a project on voltage-gated sodium channels. So now I started out because I was interested in psychology. And now, some years later, I was studying one protein in the brain, right? So this is kind of like one of the things that I, one of the experiences I had, I wouldn't say one of the things I discovered, but one of the experiences I had was that the farther along I got, the more what I was doing got narrowed, right? I felt that, you know, the metaphor I sort of, thought of was like, imagine that you're in a, in a hole and it's sort of shaped like a cone. And the more you struggle, the farther down you get, right? And so I was studying one protein in the brain, but of course that was okay at the time because I was still excited. I was excited to be there. And now I'm a postdoc at Bill Catterall's lab. And the project I got was, I, I, I bring this up every time I go to the dentist. The project that I got, that I ended up working on concerned voltage-gated sodium channels and, and drugs called local anesthetics like lidocaine and benzocaine. So the way that these drugs work, if you've ever been, gone to the dentist and had to have your face numbed, the way that these drugs work is that they inject the Novocaine, which is a procaine, I think. It's, it's just a local anesthetic, one of the many different kinds of local anesthetics, but they inject it into the nerve. And what it does is it blocks voltage-gated sodium channels. So then those axons don't propagate action potential. So there are all these pain sensing neurons in your teeth. And when the dentist is drilling on your tooth, all those neurons are just getting activated and they're firing action potentials. But when they get to where the bolus of local anesthetic is, the sodium channels are blocked and the action potentials stop there. So, but it, it, the project that I worked on was investigating the molecular mechanism by which these drugs interacted with, with sodium channels and blocked sodium channels. It turns out it's kind of a complicated the, the way that these drugs work is kind of complicated and interesting. And it's related to another family of drugs, which are uh, uh, which are used as anti-epileptic drugs. So drugs like phenytoin or dilantin. So these are commonly used anti-epileptic drugs they give, that are given prophylactically to people who have, um, who have epilepsy. And they work in a very similar way. So what we were working on was trying to understand, because Catterall was in a pharmacology department, so what we were working on was trying to understand how these drugs interacted with the sodium channel. So we were using the techniques that were uh, 
at the time, cutting edge techniques, psychotherapy mutagenesis, and then expressing the channels, the mutant channels in xenopazuicides again, because that's the thing. I came there with this methodology using xenopazuicides. So we would make mutations in cloned ion channels, express the mutant channels in xenopazuicides, study their functional properties. And we ended up um, with, a, you know, the work ended up turning out to be fairly interesting. We, we actually got uh, uh, some pretty good papers. The, the paper that really kind of enabled me to come here to McGill was a paper that was published in Science in, in 1994. And it, it really has been cited a lot. So that turned out to be a good paper. So I managed to get one really good paper out of my postdoc and a number of other um, reasonably good papers out of the postdoc. Um, so then, you know, armed with that, I started looking for academic positions. And again, I was very much thinking about where I wanted to go. So if I could have stayed in Seattle, I, that would have been fantastic, but that wasn't an option. And I, 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 um, uh, I, I applied to a number of different places, but I remember there was an ad in the back of science for 10 faculty positions. This was in, I think, um, maybe 1993 or 1994, for 10 faculty positions at a place called the Montreal Neurological Institute, in, in, which was in Montreal. Obviously, you guys know that, but I didn't know that at the time, right? And so, first of all, I had never heard of the Montreal Neurological Institute in my entire life, right? I had no idea what it was. Secondly, I knew next to nothing about Montreal, but it sounded cool. It sounded like a great place to go. I thought, Montreal, that sounds interesting, you know, because there were a lot of places I don't want to name any names. There were a lot of places that I didn't want to go that were up in where I could see that there were advertisements for faculty positions, but I'm like, I'm not going there. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to that place. But Montreal, I thought, that sounds pretty interesting. So I came here, and in any case, I managed to get hired along with this large cohort of people. So there was a whole bunch of, of uh, colleagues who came in at the same time as me, who are now all aging with me, um, this the cohort of, of scientists. So now I was at Montreal Neurological Institute, and uh, I was studying voltage gated sodium channels and how they interact with uh, anti epileptic drugs. And of course, that fit in with the work at the Montreal Neurological because the neuro. One of the main things that the neuro has been famous for and that the neuro is still involved in research and clinical care in is epilepsy. And so the fact that I was studying um, drugs that were important anti-epileptic drugs uh, kind of made me a good fit for the neuro. And also the other thing was that at the time we were beginning to realize that mutations in ion channels can cause neurological diseases, including epilepsy. So there were at the time, a number of mutations, naturally occurring mutations in voltage-gated sodium channels that had been identified that caused familial forms of epilepsy. So the idea was I was gonna come here and I was gonna study local anesthetic drug, or not local anesthetics and anti-epileptic drugs and why certain kinds of mutations in voltage-gated sodium channels cause epilepsy. And that's the work that I did. And um, so I, I did that for many years and I was very modestly successful. Um, so I, I got my CAHR operating grant at the time it was MRC operating grant. The first time I applied, I got my grant. And then I renewed my grant, I think four more times. And every time I got the grant, the first time, I always got every renewal I got the very first time. And, um, uh, and every time I would get the grant, the, in the reviews for the grant, they would say, you know, this guy's lab is just about to take off, right? You know what I mean? He's right on the cusp of really making it. And, and every time I would get that feedback, I would think to myself, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. That's not what's happening at all. Because I was in the lab and I knew that that wasn't what's happening at all. And I, you know, I managed to publish some papers, you know, okay papers, nothing, nothing anywhere near at the level that I published as a postdoc because I was working in a very powerful lab as a postdoc. Um, but I started, I think I started to appreciate a couple of things. And this is where I'm trying to get to maybe where there was some, I, in, in retrospect, in reflection, I think I, I learned some lessons. And the first thing was I began to realize or pre, I sense, I began to sense that the reason I, not the reason I got the job, but a reason I got the job in the first place, and probably the reason why I kept getting my grant renewed 
was not that I was good at running a lab because I actually wasn't very good at running a lab. Um, and I didn't like running a lab, but it was because I was, a, I was good at writing grants. I was, I was really good at writing grants and I was really good at giving talks. And I was especially, um, I was especially good. I liked being didactic. I liked explaining things. So for example, when I gave the job talk at, at the Neuro, just to give an example, you know, a lot of people there didn't do uh, you know, electrophysiology. It's kind of esoteric, even for people who are in neuroscience, but maybe doing uh, molecular neuroscience or, or work or things like that. You know, they 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 see the, you know, they go to these talks, my, my molecular neuroscience colleagues, they go to these talks and there's all these squiggly lines and they don't know what they're looking at. They're like, what is all this stuff? It doesn't make any sense to me. And, and I've noticed that electrophysiologists generally don't bother to even try and explain what they're what they're actually showing. They they present these slides with like electrophysiologists I've noticed have a tendency to present like 18 panels in one slide with a whole bunch of lines on them, and then they don't explain any of it. But I really liked explaining things. I liked explaining the experiments that I was doing and explaining what they showed. And, and people would walk away and they'd say, wow, I actually learned something. I didn't, I've never understood why, what those, what those figures showed, but now I understand. And it was the same thing in the grants. I read these grants and the feedback was, this was such a clearly written grant. It was so clear exactly where this grant was going and what this person was trying to do. And so I started getting, getting the sense that, that, um, that whatever the skills were that I had, they were skills that were related to uh, communication and to explaining things, and particularly in, in a scientific context. But in fact, working in the lab was something that I wasn't really very comfortable with. So there are a certain set of skills. I mean, one of the things about being an academic, right, is the fact that you're trained in a certain very narrow set of skills as a graduate student and postdoc. Mm -hmm. And then you become an independent investigator and there are a whole set of skills that you actually need that you're not trained in, right? So you're not trained, for example, in how to manage money. You're not trained in how to manage people. You're not trained in all kinds of things, all sorts of skills that are important for being a successful independent investigator as opposed to being a successful graduate student or successful postdoc, right? So you come up, for example, in my case, I came out, what, by the time I got to McGill, I was a very experienced electrophysiologist within a kind of narrow, narrowly defined set of skills, right? So I knew how to do patch clamp electrophysiology and things like that. And I knew a little bit of molecular biology, which I learned as a postdoc. So I learned some technical skills that were useful in the lab. And I was able to apply them as a postdoc, right? Because I had, first of all, I had the protection of my supervisor financially. And secondly, because he was in charge of the sort of overarching program. When I got to be an independent investigator, that fell on me. Now, I was the one who was responsible for all of that. And um, one of the things I discovered is I didn't like managing students. I didn't I, this. I like students, so don't, I'm going to try to make that clear. But I didn't like managing them in the lab. And I didn't like the pressure of having to be responsible for their projects uh, or the postdocs projects. And, um, and I didn't like being in the lab. So I... At some, but, but there was something that I did like, and that is I really liked the teaching, right? I really liked that, and um, and that was related, right? So this was connected to the the kind, kinds of skills that I was comfortable with, right? I was I really liked giving talks. I really liked presenting my work. I really liked writing grants. I really liked explaining things and discussing things with students. So. I, um, what I decided at some point was, and, and that made me especially odd, that would have made me an oddball if I'd been, if, if I had been hired by, say, the McGill Department of Physiology, but at least in the Department of Physiology or the Department of Pharmacology or the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology, um, at least there's a teaching mandate. But at the Neuro, there's really no undergraduate teaching mandate at all. The Neuro is a, is a, Research Institute affiliated and, and, and neurological hospital affiliated with McGill University, right? So, um, and in fact, uh, faculty at the neuro, one of the things they have to do is they have to go out and find teaching assignments so that they can fulfill their teaching obligations to get tenure. So in my case, what happened was I was doing that, but the students really liked me. I was getting asked to teach more and more and more. 
more. So more and more people were saying, I've heard you're a good teacher. We'd like you to teach some parts of our class too. So um, uh, I, I was taking on more and more and more teaching responsibilities. And I found that I really liked that. I really enjoyed that. So at some point, about 10 years ago, I made a decision. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to immerse myself in the academic role of, of uh, teaching. And, and that's, you know, you might think of that as a very sort of narrowly defined role, like you're an instructor in a course. But what I realized, what I, I decided I ought to do, and I needed to, if I was going to take this career path, was I needed to really embrace all the different roles that a person can play at the university uh, that are involved in, that, that are related to effective teaching. So I, I, right now I teach, and I have for many years, taught many, many, many classes. I got involved in, uh, in education for medical students. Uh, so I teach the undergraduate students, I teach medical students, I teach the graduate students. Um, and I also got involved in other things that are related to the development of teaching at McGill. So for example, I've done many things at McGill. There's a, there's a, an organization, I'm not sure what the right term is to describe it, called Teaching and Learning Services. There may be something like this at, at UDEM as well, right? Which is, which is um, at McGill to promote effective teaching at McGill, right? And so I got involved with that and I've been involved in workshops and other things, and other uh, activities that are designed to facilitate and to uh, improve teaching at McGill. As you indicated, I was uh, I took on the role of being the associate director at the, for the integrated program in neuroscience. So I was involved in the development of that neuroscience program. And I was the first uh, associate director. The director was named Josephine Nelbontiu. She's now the dean of graduate studies. And I was the associate director working with her. And so Josephine and I developed the, the program as it currently exists and oversaw the program for a number of years. I was the uh, director for the cognitive science program for a number of years. Um, uh, and the other thing that I did is, um, and, and I coordinate a large uh, course, a longitudinal course, the medical students at McGill. And the uh, other thing that I got involved in was faculty development. So faculty development is helping have like, the faculty learn how to be better faculty, but in particular, how to be better teachers, right? And so faculty development involves workshops and other activities related to helping faculty become better teachers. And so um, this transition that I made, so this is where I'm, I'm, that's my, my story is a little bit different than many stories. So there, there's, a, I, I think, a couple things here that I want to sort of maybe try and articulate as maybe the lessons learned from this for me. I mean, the lessons that I learned. And, and the first thing is that this was really difficult. At first, and I was very apprehensive because I was at the, I was at a research institute, and I, I was a tenured professor at this point at a research institute, and I was jumping into you know jumping off a cliff, and I had no idea what was going to happen, but I did it anyway because I felt like I really need to do this, and I need to find out what's going to happen at this time. I need to I need to uh, I need to pursue a career that is meaningful and rewarding to me as opposed to feeling that they constantly have to pursue a career that's defined for me by some other you know, force or some other entity. And, and if that works out wonderful, and if it doesn't work out, well, I, that's okay too. And so I worked really hard at making that work and it has worked out and I've been, it's been, and I think that the, the time that I've spent over the last 10 years really focusing on these aspects of being an academic, which after all, uh, academics are at, at universities and universities do actually teach students in addition to doing research. And so I think that embracing that role uh, has made me feel a lot more satisfaction uh, and, and made me feel like I was actually making a greater contribution to McGill than I could have made being a, a sort of second rate, you know, you know, sort of struggling along as a, as a sort of second rate uh, scientist and just taking up lab space and, and, and Taking, taking up some grant money from other people, not really producing anything of any great um, consequence. The, a couple other things though, I'll just mention a couple other things. Well, actually, so the, the other thing that I, you know, I've, I've talked to students about this story before and 
when I talk to them about it, the one thing that I, I, I try to express to them is that one of the things that I think in retro, see, I have no regrets about being here where I'm at right now, obviously, but one of the things I feel like I learned in retrospect from all of this is that at each step in this process, when I got that job as a technician, when I got the opportunity to be a graduate student in the ladies' lab, when I got the opportunity to do the postdoc in Catterall's lab, when I got the opportunity to be a faculty member at the neuro, at each step in the process, there was this, this balance between seizing opportunities and, and defining your own identity, right? And I think that in, I think that I was definitely erred on the size of seizing opportunities, right? So I had an opportunity to work as a technician in this lab, and I didn't, it wasn't work that I was particularly interested in or liked, but it was an opportunity. And then I got an opportunity to be a graduate student at Irvine. And even though it was in a topic that had never occurred to me to be interested in, I took that opportunity and told myself, I'm going to be interested in this just because this is an opportunity. And I worked really, really hard at it. And then when I was got to be a postdoc and I was now studying one, literally one protein in the brain, um, uh, it, that wasn't something that I would have had intrinsic interest in, but it was an opportunity. So I seized that opportunity. And really even at McGill, um, I, it was the same thing. It was an opportunity and I took the opportunity. And so I don't regret taking those opportunities, but sometimes I wonder what would have happened if I had been able to play a more active role in defining what I was interested in and what I wanted to do with my career, what I wanted to do as an academic and what I actually really found interesting in science. So I don't think, I don't have an answer to that, but I do think since I'm speaking to trainees, I'm speaking to graduate students, I think, and, and, uh, and postdocs, I, I think that's really something that I would reflect on a lot is to what extent am I, am I defining my, my, my interests and to what extent are my interests being defined for me and how do I strike a balance between those two things? Because you have to seize the opportunities when they're there, but at the same time, you know, I, I think that if I had a stronger sense of self, a stronger sense of self-identity as a, a graduate student, for example, that I might have carved out a niche for my, an a, a research niche for myself, a scientific niche for myself that was more in line with what my actual interests were. And, and, or, and I'm not sure maybe that I even knew what my interests were um, when I was 23 or 24 years old and starting out in graduate school. But maybe if I forced myself to think really, really hard about it, I would have been able to define those interests more effectively rather than having them defined for me. So just to circle back around. So but just the last little coda on this is that um, when I made this decision that I was going to be a teacher, I got an opportunity to teach a course in anatomy and cell biology on uh, neuroanatomy. So this is as far away from studying voltage-gated sodium channels and neuroscience as you can get, right? And now, now it's like the whole functional anatomy of the brain. And I've been teaching that course for 10 years and that is fun. Now, that's something I really love to do because in that course, what we do is we talk about the anatomy of the brain, but we talk about it in the context of how does the organization of the brain, how does the different parts of the brain and how they're connected together and how they talk to each other, how does all of that create memory and consciousness and cognition and intelligence and all of the, inter the things that, that interested me in the brain in the first place, right? So when I started in studying the brain as an undergraduate, I was interested in how does the brain give us a sense of personality? How does the brain enable us to have a sense of self? How does the brain enable us to make decisions, right? How, is it, how on earth is it that your brain makes decisions? That doesn't seem to make any sense that a biological organ decide whether you want to have chicken or fish for dinner, right? And, and so how does the brain do that? So in this course, we can actually talk about how, the, how the, we can use the anatomy of the brain as a point of departure to talk about all these interesting things that the brain does. So now I feel like I circled back around and I'm finding the things about neuroscience that actually um, uh, interest me. And that's where I'm at now. So that's the end of my story. And so now I'd be happy to take any comments or questions from you or anybody else in the in our in our uh, virtual audience, in our audience, beautiful, yeah. Thank you so much. It's a it's a fascinating story, David. Um, I I was curious. 
Uh, so it, if I understand correctly, like it, it, it looks like it, at some point in your career, you had this kind of epiphany that what you really cared about and what you seem to be really good at was this, this explaining of, of complex yeah. stuff and that showed up in grants, but also in teaching and, and, and so forth. So then you decided to go for it. I, I was wondering, like, so it, it sounded like, like, uh, like, I hope you don't mind me saying, like, it sounds like it sort of came relatively late in a way. Like, yeah. you're sort of like already quite far along in, in right. your career. So I was curious, like, like um, do you have a sense of like why that came at that moment in time and what helped you to come to that understanding of what you were really about? I, I think that it, 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 you might, well, I think that the, not not to alarm anyone here, but I think it was a kind of crisis of confidence, right? I, I, I think it kind of reached a, a kind of point, point of crisis where I really started feeling like, this isn't working. This isn't working for me. This isn't working. And, um, uh, you know, you can sort of keep trying to do this and probably puttering along doing this um, because, you know, not, not to uh, not to be too... I mean, I think that there are other researchers who basically do that, right? Who, who have reached the point in their careers where they're really not producing cutting-edge research anymore, but they just keep doing it because that's what they do and they keep applying for the grants and they, they don't want to lose their lab space and they, they keep doing using the same methodologies that they've been using for 30 years and they're, they're not really, nothing that they're doing is really cutting edge anymore, but they can still churn out a few mediocre papers every year and sort of sustain themselves uh, as scientists. And I, I, I felt that that was something I just didn't want to do. So it was a kind of crisis of confidence, but at the same time, the sense I had that these are the parts of, um, of being a scientist that I really like. In other words, when I, I, for a long time, I had felt like the parts of science that I really like are the communication aspects of science. Uh, and that, um, and, and that the technical aspects I, I, I was less interested in. I, by, by technical, I mean, you know, like like getting some new microscope and figuring out how it worked, right? Or or getting some, because electrophysiology is very gadget oriented, right? Lots of buttons and knobs to push and things like that. And a lot of the people that are into it are the kind of people that if they weren't in neuroscience or if they weren't in biology, they might be electrical engineers or something like that, right? And so, um, and so uh, I, I realized that that really wasn't, where my interests were, I, I felt for a long time what I was really interested in was the more communicating in science. You know, and, and it, again, if I perhaps had a stronger sense of pursuing my identity earlier on, maybe I would have pursued that earlier on. You know, for example, there are, there are some really interesting science writers out there who do very interesting work in science writing for, for, for prestigious publications and things like that. And maybe something like that would have been interesting, but I was, you know, one of the things I think about, one of the things I, I find that's interesting, and again, I think this is relevant to students now, is that in particular, when, when I was doing my training, you know, the, the path was very grooved in, in science, right? So you, you got into graduate school, you got a PhD, you got a postdoc, and then you got an academic position, right? And this was very... That, that's just the, the path was grooved for you. So you really, that, you didn't have to think about that path, right? If you wanted to do something different, well, that would require effort. But if you wanted to just go on autopilot, you just did, you did your graduate, did your graduate work until you got close to the end and you applied for some postdocs, you got a postdoc, and then when you got done with that, you applied for an academic position. And basically that's, that's, um, that's what I did, right? And I, I think that, again, in retrospect, I think if I had a stronger sense of, self-identity early on, I might have thought, even at the end of my PhD, well, what do I really want to do with this thing? What do I really want to do now? And I think that's relevant now because more and more students are getting, for example, PhDs or masters or PhDs or, or postdoc, finishing postdocs for that matter, and then taking going on alternate career routes, right? Because the idea that everybody who gets a PhD is going to get to a postdoc and then an academic position is not realistic. And it's not what a lot of people want to do. So I think that it is important for so for people who are at this stage, for those of you in the audience who are at this stage in your careers, to be really thinking about that, you know, what your identity is right now, what it is you want to do, because you're not constrained by that sort of groove that we felt constrained by, or I felt constrained by. So 
was uh, just finishing up my training. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It, 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 I'm, I'm wondering also in the case, so in your case, what came up when you asked the question about what you really, what you really cared about was was like teaching and communicating, and it, like it, I, I was wondering, it, it sounded like from from what you said that like one signal to in that in that decision was that you just also were really good at it, like you got feedback, you yeah, got like right. asked by people to teach and so on, and um and, and so I, I was wondering what, like. Were you, was it that like you were good at it because you cared about it or like you cared about it because you were good at it? Did you have like a sense of like how that? Yeah, well, let's say so. Right? That's, I think a little bit of both, right? Yeah. I think that, I think that I, when you, when you do something and you get positive feedback, it makes you feel like I want to do more of this, right? right? Because this yeah. is something I feel good. That's getting me, excuse me, the kind of positive feedback that makes me feel good. But I, I also think that, um, um, you know, that for some kind of peculiar reason, I, I actually really enjoy explaining things. And, and that, uh, and, and so that's something I've always enjoyed. And I've always been, um, something that I've always put a lot of effort into. I don't wanna say I've always been good at, but it's something that I always put a lot of thought into. You know, I remember when I was writing grants, I remember when I was reading grants, and I was on grant review committees, I would read a lot of grants and I would think to myself, these guys, who are writing these grants are smarter than me and they're better scientists than me and this is an absolutely horrible grant you know what are these guys thinking and when when i would write a grant i would, I would write the grant and then i would rewrite it and i would rewrite it and i would rewrite it and i would spend I would spend a whole day on two sentences right because i'd say that's not right that's not what I, you know that sentence it's it's full of words and the words are sort of vaguely related to what I'm doing, but they're actually empty and they don't re really say anything, right? I've, 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 you know, I've, I've, I've cobbled together some prefabricated scientific phrases that are often used in my field to make a sentence, but I actually don't, I'm not saying anything. And the reason I'm not saying anything is that I actually don't know what it is I want to say, right? What is it I actually want to say? And then I think and think and think about that. And then I would write the grant and then I'd say, but well, wait a minute, I'm talking about something here, but I haven't introduced that up there. And so I really think hard about this. And, and one of the things I think that, that one of the, like, this maybe is a piece of advice too, but one of the things that I think that I learned that was helpful and that I think made me effective in, in writing grants and in teaching are two things actually. One is that I think that when people teach, and when people, you know, write grants, right? Or grants are a good example, you know, right? Because when you write a grant, you're, 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 you're writing, well, one of the things that people do when they teach, let me give this example, is they think to themselves, okay, I want, I'm going to tell, I'm going to, I want to tell my students this, and then I want to tell them this, and then I want to tell them this, and then I want to tell them this, right? And when people write grants, they do the same thing. They say, first, I'm going to tell them this, and then I'm going to tell them this, and then I'm going to tell them this, and then I'm going to tell them this. But the problem is, can't think about it that way. What it's not what you're going to tell them; it's what they're going to hear. It's not what you're going to write; it's what they're going to understand. And and I think that one of the things that one of the things that has always preoccupied me in, in teaching and in writing is thinking, putting myself in the minds of the people that are actually reading or listening or uh, trying to understand the material. And um, and I think that's what one of the things that is so crucial to being effective. And, and that, so that's why if I was writing a grant and I would introduce something and I'd say, wait a minute, why on earth should I expect that they know what this is, right? At first, I have to go back and explain what this thing is, um, because if they don't know that, this, this part I'm saying right now isn't going to make any sense. And, and so really thinking a lot about who the audience is and how the audience is going to be affected by what you say or what you write. And so these are preoccu real preoccupations of mine. And a sort of related thing is, I, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this, but I think that it's reasonable to assume that, like I had a, I had a uh, uh, one of my professors at, at, at my graduate, and I was a graduate student, 
He said, he said, I'm going to explain something to you now. It's very complicated, but he said, I'm going to assume that you have zero prior knowledge and vast intelligence, right? So, and, and so, in other words, I don't assume that my audience is dumb because they're not dumb. Uh, undergraduate students are very smart. Graduate students are very smart. Obviously, the faculty members who read grants are smart. Not necessarily, I mean, obvious, but, but, um, but I can't assume that they know what I know. Right, that's the thing, and that's the part I think that people have difficulty with, because, and especially, I think it's especially difficult for academics because they're experts. When you're an expert, you know so much about a topic that it's difficult for you to comprehend that other people don't understand the topic. And this doesn't just apply in academics. You know, I, I was talking. I, I remember the other day I was I, I had to talk to these financial advisors, right? Because I'm getting old, so I just talked to this financial advisor, and he starts talking to me about these things and. I had no idea what he was talking about. And you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I'm not dumb. And, and I thought, problem is that he, he lives this every day and all these terms and this jargon and these phrases that he just for him are second nature mean absolutely nothing to me. And I had the same experience when I taught the scientists or and many people in vast in other fields. I'll ask other people, what do you do? You know, some person is in a different field, not even an academic field. I'll say, well, what do you do? And they'll they'll tell me what they do, and at the end I'll, be, I'll say, "Well, that's very interesting." And I not the slightest idea, right? Because they're so immersed in their work that they don't understand that the terms and the phrases and the concepts that they're just that are coming out of them are things that mean absolutely nothing to me. And so I think that this has been a really, for me, one of the one of the reasons why I enjoy communicating is I like to think about it that way. I like to think about okay. You know, how is what I'm writing or saying impacting the people I'm talking to, and what are they understanding, and what are they taking out of this? And so, staying really focused on that, I think, has really helped me as a teacher. And so, for those of you who are maybe going to do some teaching, I think that's one of the most important things to think about as a teacher: is what are my students actually going to learn from this, uh, as opposed to what am I going to tell them? And I think the same thing applies in things like writing grants, because you know, one of the things about writing a grant is that. Um, it's very likely that one of the, pe the people who read your grant are going to be knowledgeable sort of generally in your area, but they're not going to be experts in what you do, right? So if you write a grant, if I write a grant on voltage-gated sodium channels and submit it to one of the, the neuroscience committee in CIHR, it might get reviewed by somebody who knows something about neuroscience, but they may not know anything about voltage-gated sodium channels. And so they, you know, I, I can't be, I can't assume this knowledge that they have. And if I do assume it, they're gonna pick up my grant at 10 o'clock at night after a long, hard day, and they're gonna read the first page and they're gonna say, oh God, here we go again. Another one of these grants, another one of these grants that I can't understand, right? And so if you do them the favor of making it so that even somebody who's not in your field and who's tired and who's had a long day can pick up your grant and has and already read seven other grants, can pick up your grant and read this one and see now here's one that makes sense. Here's a grant that I can understand. That's going to be really effective. And I think that's why I was effective in writing grants because I made that assumption. I always thought about that all the time when I was writing the grant. Are the people who are reading this actually going to understand what I'm writing? And, and that seemed to work. At least it worked in terms of, of uh, getting the grants funded, not, not so much in terms of actually implementing the, the projects that I proposed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I'd love to know if like, there's questions from the audience. Is anything anybody online asking questions? So we have a question. Okay. They're asking how do you recommend addressing this student or interest, for example, teaching or science communication instead of research with uh, PhD supervisors? I, could you just repeat the first part? I missed the very beginning. Yeah. Part. Uh, how do you recommend addressing this pivot or interest, for example, teaching? Or right. Well, I think that, you know, uh, the, the obvious thing is if there are opportunities available as a graduate student, particularly, and for postdocs, too, where, you know, they're more likely to be, well, opportunities for graduate students than postdocs, but seizing those opportunities to do teaching uh, is, the, is the way to do it. And, and I, you know, I know, for example, in our graduate program, we have a very large graduate program, um, the neuroscience program at McGill, it's a, it's a cross-departmental program and it has about 400 graduate students in it. Um, but the teaching opportunities are, are really few and far between, which is really 
fortunate. And but nevertheless, the students that are sufficiently motivated are able to find teaching opportunities. And I think that's the best way to get started is to is to uh, is to take the time. But first of all, that's just like doing research that gives you a chance to find out is this something I really like doing. Um, and secondly, it gives you practice. And thirdly, it gives you something you can put on a CV that then may help you get subsequent uh, opportunities down the line. But I, I think that, um, you know, again, for, for students now, for trainees now, it's really important that you try to seek out opportunities to, you know, to explore, not to seek, to, to seek out and explore opportunities to find your identity in ways that might uh, go outside of just coming in every day and doing your, your, your research project. Because again, many, many uh, trainees now are not going to end up staying in academic careers. And there are lots of other things that you can do with the skills that you've developed. So you know, I have colleagues who've gone on to many other kinds of careers outside of strictly being academic. And I think you just need to push really hard identify what things you're interested in and, and find ways to pursue those interests. And um, the another question was how they can communicate this with their supervisor, that their interest is not research. Like well, I, I think that you can't, I'm not sure because, I, well, a couple of things. One is I don't think you can communicate to your supervisor that you're not interested in research because that would probably not be a good idea because if you're not interested in research, you probably shouldn't be in a research lab. And I think most supervisors wouldn't take that as a good sign. Um, but you can be interested in research. And in addition to that, you can explore other interests and you can discuss this with your supervisor. And one of the things about one of the things about being a graduate student in particular in say biomedical research is that the nature of the interaction is such that it's easy for the supervisor to feel that you are an employee, you work for them because they're paying you off their grant. You are important for their, their, their research productivity. And so therefore you are their employee. And it's understandable for you to feel that, that as well, that you're an employee, but you're not an employee, you're a student. And, and, and you, it's, it's, you are entitled and titles maybe not the right word, but you ought to, you know, embrace that identity. You, you, you know, when I hear when I was a, a, a you know, a, a, the associate director of the neuroscience program, you know, students, it was not uncommon for students to approach me and discuss the fact that they wanted to TA a course, or they wanted to take a certain kind of course, or they wanted to do some other kind of professional development. And their supervisors were saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. I expect you in the lab all the time. Work for me, and this is what you have to do. And um, and I, I think that that is it, that's that's just not right. That's not ethical. I mean, you're not you're not an employee. You're a student, and as a student, you are there to become educated and to develop your own career and your own identity, your own academic identity, your own career identity. And of course, you have obligations to your supervisor. But if the supervisor is saying, you're my employee and you have to work for me uh, and, and, and you can't do anything else, I think that, that that's a kind of a red flag. I, I would say that that's a red flag. So if you talk to your supervisor and the supervisor isn't willing to discuss with you the idea that that being a student means developing your own sense of identity and your own academic identity, um, then that, you know, I, I would say that's a red flag. I'm not sure what you can do about it. You know, if, you're, if you're deeply into your project, I'm not sure what you can do about that, but I would definitely see that as, as kind of a red flag in terms of the relationship that you have with your supervisor. It's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to be um, kind of a, a um, it, it's an alliance, right? You're supposed to be working together towards common goals and the common goals include research progress, but they also include your personal professional development. And a good supervisor should recognize that that's part of their responsibility as a supervisor. Yeah. I have a question. I want to know more about uh, your PhD practice. 
Pardon? The PhD. Uh, my, my PhD path? Like in what sense? More about in what sense? It was what we struggled more during our academic career and uh, it really was something decisive for your path. Um, so, so my, my, I'm not sure I understand. Like, are you, you're asking me to sort of reflect back on my PhD and what was, and can you just ask it one more time? Yeah, just, I, I'm sorry, I'm just having that. I just want to know the struggles of your PhD, because you said you need to, I think that, I think there, I don't think there were any struggles in my PhD. I think what I, what, I think what I'm, what I was suggesting is this, when I was, and again, I, I, I'm saying this as something that I reflect on in retrospect. And then I think it's something that I would suggest that students should reflect on. When I was a graduate student, I was very, very motivated, right? I worked really, really hard. And I, uh, uh, it meant, it was very important for me to be like one of the best graduate students in the program. But in retrospect, I was mo my motivation was not that I was fascinated by the project. My motivation was I wanted to impress my supervisor and I wanted to be one of the best graduate students in the pro graduate program, right? So I was being motivated not by something that was inside of me, but by external factors, right? There were things, there were, there were other people outside of me and it was their interests and their motivations that were motivating me, right? And it was the same thing as a postdoc. As a postdoc, I did really, really hard as a postdoc, and I wanted to be one of the best postdocs in uh, in my lab, right? And and my my supervisor, he singled me out and me and a couple other people out because he said, "I want you guys to go into academic careers," right? So I was one of the people that he sort of selected. He said, "You ought to go." And, you know, I don't want you to go into industry like all these other. Postdocs, because a lot of the postdocs at that point were just going into pharmaceutical companies and said, no, you have to pursue an academic career. And, um, and you know, I was very motivated. But again, in retrospect, my motivation was external. It was other people's interests and other people's um, goals that were motivating me, right? Not my own intrinsic internal goals. So that's what I mean by struggle. At the time, it wasn't a struggle. At the time, I was... I, I was like, this is great. This is great. I'm a, I'm a graduate student. I'm a postdoc. This is fantastic. And it's only kind of in retrospect when I look back that I realized that for the most part, the, the motivations weren't coming from inside of me. They were coming from of me trying to, to excel based on other people's expectations and other people's uh, concerns and goals and values. And that's the part that I think if I could do over again, I would at the very least I mean, it's easy. I mean, you have the maturity, you have the wisdom of age, of age when you get old. If I, if I had that wisdom when I was back then, I wish I had spent more time really reflecting deeply on what my own motivations were and what, what was really in, in motivating me from the inside. Maybe things would have came out just the same anyway, but I never really gave myself that opportunity because I was so fixated on, you know, being the best graduate student at UC Irvine and being the best postdoc in Catalyst Lab. So that, that's kind of what I mean. So you haven't considered going to industry, for example? No, no, I didn't. And, and I, I have to say that I think I would have been more unhappy if I had gone into industry. And, and um, again, it's, it's you know, some people, that, that's a really good fit. For some people, industry is a really good fit. But personally, I really like the academic environment, right? I, I, like, uh, I like working at a university. I like the the rhythms of the university, right? I mean, I like the fact that I don't have to have any kind of like security clearance. And I like the fact that I don't have to wear a tie. And I like the fact that I pretty much, you know, on a, I have a tremendous amount of autonomy. I mean, that's very important to me to have autonomy. And so, you know, I, I mean, I'm mean, being a bit self-indulgent because I want all of the perks of academia without necessarily wanting to follow the rules of academia. But um, I, I think, or personally, for me, an academic career, some kind of career like that was important for me because I wanted that kind of autonomy. And I don't think you have, my impression is you don't have that kind of autonomy in a pharmaceutical position, although there are other advantages 
to having a job in a pharmaceutical position. And most of most of my, for example, when I was in Catterall's lab, all these postdocs that I knew, almost all of them, went into work for biotechs or for for a big pharmaceutical companies after they left Catterall's lab. So um, I think that's a good fit for a lot of people. It just wasn't. Yeah. But thank you. You're discussing arriving at a decision to get into the pivot um, years ago uh, based on the theory that at that point, there you see a way that that information could have been used earlier in your career. Do you understand that? In the sense of like, yeah, but you were able to make that right. because of how right. the career that you had, say, I don't want to teach right now. How yeah. Earlier? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a good question. That's a mis that I, uh, That's a, a mystery to me. I don't know. But but the, the thing is, so you know, all the decisions that I made led to the place that I'm at right now, right? And and I think that where I'm at right now is a good place. And so I, I really can't regret any of the decisions that I've made. But what I notice when I reflect back is not that I should have done something different at some point along the way, but that it never occurred to me to reflect on what I was doing in a serious way, to actually ask myself that any step along the way, you know, again, why, what are, what are my real, what are my actual values? What are my actual motivations and my actual goals? And am I doing the things that I, are the things that I do, I'm doing, things that are directed towards those motivations and those goals, right? You know, like uh, there's one way that people put this is like, you know, I'm climbing the ladder as fast as I can, but is the ladder leaning against the right wall as I'm climbing? So I don't, I, I have no regrets about how the decisions that I've made, but I, I, it, in retrospect, I didn't reflect on any of that earlier. And if I had, well, maybe I would have done something different, or maybe not. Maybe I would have just said, well, I, you know, this is very interesting. I've reflected on this, but I still think this is the best course of action. It's very possible I would have done that. But it would have been interesting if I had at least had that self-reflection. You know, I think that that, it, it's, just, it's just interesting to, to try to imagine what that would have been like. And if I was giving advice to myself uh, uh, in my past self, I would say, do that. Go through that exercise of actually thinking really hard about what it is you actually want to accomplish in your life and whether the direction that you're taking is actually directing you towards accomplishing the goals that actually are meaningful for you. Because who knows, maybe it would have gone on to something completely different. And it was interesting to me that one of the first things you said was like, you had kind of a realization that you weren't very happy at one stage and you said, but I'm stopped every person to say that. Right. So Right, exactly. You know, you know. Well, that's that's right. That's 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 a really good point. You know, so so for example, uh, you know, it takes. I I think in a way, kind of what you're also saying is that it takes to to say, okay, I'm I'm in something and it's working, but is this really what I want to do? And is this really the way I want to do it? it? Takes maturity, and it also takes courage. It takes self confidence. And, you know, those were things that when I was 23, I did not have. I didn't have the maturity. I didn't have the self-confidence um, to do those things. So part of the reason why I think I just did what, uh, you know, whatever came to me was that, that I just didn't have the qualities at that time that would have enabled me to actually do that, right? And, and so some people maybe do, but, but I, I didn't at that time. I would, never, I would have never gone to my graduate supervisor uh, after six months, and said, "Well, you know, uh, you know, ion channels just really don't interest me. I think I'm gonna, I'd like to uh, switch to a different supervisor. I couldn't. I, I just didn't have that kind of person." Some people do that, of course. And they might be able to be more assertive. I have one more question. Okay. So, how do you feel about PhD students taking on a position that doesn't necessarily require PhD, but really interests the student? Is that a waste of the training? Right. Well, again, I mean, this, this I mean, so a couple, I'm trying to think through this. Yeah, because so first of all, um, when you when you do a PhD, you you know, at the end you get a degree, but you also learn a lot of things along the way, right? And so 
the value of your PhD isn't necessarily just contained in the degree. It's also contained in the things that you do to get to the PhD. So if you've learned about things that interest you, you've learned, um, you, you acquire knowledge that's of value to you and that you might want to apply in a way that really deviates from your PhD and doesn't require the degree, uh, that's not necessarily, I think, bad thing, right? I think that, you know, so so in other words, I think it sounds like what the question is implying is what if I get the PhD and then do something that doesn't require a PhD? Was that PhD a waste of time? And and I mean, it may might have been a waste of time, but not necessarily. I think that that if you if you've learned over the course of your PhD things that are of value to you or things that are that are meaningful and important, if you apply those things in a, in a way that, that isn't directly related to, you know, waving your PhD in front of, say, an employer and saying, look, I have this PhD, and that's why I should get this job, I still think that might be a really valuable thing to do. And again, I mean, just to circle back to this, this, you know, sort of basic idea that I've been trying to introduce, um, one of the things that I, one of the things that I, I do uh, as part of faculty development is we, we do workshops on personal effectiveness. And one of the things that we talk about right at the start of these workshops is this idea that the, one of the first steps in personal effectiveness is identifying core values, identifying what it is that you actually want to accomplish with your life. And so if you're thinking about your life in those terms, in the terms of what do I really want to pursue that's going to make my life meaningful, it, it, it doesn't, and, and that involves doing something that doesn't directly uh, involve your PhD degree, well, that's okay. If you really reflected deeply on that, and this is really important to me, and this is really a something that's of value to me, then I think it's entirely worth doing. And of course, not to mention the fact that even if you, you pursue something that doesn't directly involve your PhD degree, that PhD degree may come back later to give value to you later on. So I, 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 I would not be afraid to pursue an interest beyond your PhD that, you know, that doesn't necessarily directly utilize this, you know, the, the, the most obvious skills. Because you learn all kinds of things in the PhD beyond, um, beyond say, which buttons to push in the PCR machine, right? You learn, you learn uh, effective writing because you have to write, you have to write fellowships and you have to write chapters and you learn, um, you learn various other kinds of skills. You learn various other kinds of communication skills, for example, you have to give presentations. So you learn all kinds of things that have value that can be translated into other domains besides doing scientific research. And so I don't think that you should minimize the, the, the skills that you acquire and the knowledge that you acquire as a PhD if it's not directly related to, to uh, the degree itself. So I would encourage people to pursue the things they're interested in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in what you're saying about how you were initially more externally motivated and you managed eventually to find more of your yeah. own intrinsic motivation. I think a lot of PhD students can probably relate to that. And I was just wondering if you had other advice about how to try and make more of that shift motivation from external to You know, I, I don't have any advice. The only advice, that, well, I mean, the only advice that I would give is simply that for me, I mean, because this is an internal journey, right? You have to look inside yourself. And, you know, um, one thing that uh, is sometimes suggested uh, for people in various fields is to write a mission statement. I don't know if you ever heard of this idea, but you, the idea is you, you sit down and you write out statement that articulates what it is that you value and what it, what how those values are going to be translated into your into your goals right? into sort of your life goals and this sounds like kind of a mickey mouse thing to do but if you actually try to do it it's a really really hard thing to do to actually try to sit down and write a mission statement for your personal mission statement is a really difficult thing to do and, and so, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is that, that, that um, you know, identifying what are the internal motivations that I have, the goal, the, the things that really are val of value to me and that should be expressed in my life, 
it's not really something that you can just say, oh, okay, I got some advice from somebody, that's how you do it. It's a it's a it's an internal struggle that you really have to work hard at. And and I think that in my case, what in what I would say is that it took me a long time before I actually decided I needed to do that exercise, really think hard about what my motivations were. So the only advice I would give to students is you can do that now. You can look right now at your life and say, what, what am I doing? You know, what is it I really value? What are the things that I think are really important? What are the things that I think are really going to be of value and important in my life? And how do I want to express those things in my life? And then you can see how being a graduate student fits into those things. Because again, I, I, I think that probably may know some students that would fit this description. I, I think that many students, especially master students, are in master's programs because they don't know what else to do, right? It's like they get done with their undergrads and they're like, well, I don't know how to do anything except be a student. And I'm pretty good at being a student. So I think I'll just keep doing that for a while, right? And um, clearly that's not the kind of, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the kind of motivation I'm talking about, right? So you can keep putting off that exercise of really reflecting on, you know, what you want to accomplish and what is meaningful to you, which is in a sense what I did. Not because I did that overtly, just because it didn't occur to me for a long time to do that. I was so caught up in, in just trying to, like I said, trying to be a really good graduate student, a really good postdoc, that um, I didn't stop to reflect on how what I was doing was related to what really, what really, uh, really valuable. So that's my only advice would be do it. If you, if you think that that's something that's important, then do it. That would be what I would say. Did you have a question or a comment back here as well? So the last thing to do is what she makes sense, but as a former student, that would be very good. Oh, hi. Not wondering. And also someone that's interested in teaching, probably in the future. Um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, as you said before, as you go down the academic path, you become like a graduate student and postdoc, your field gets narrower and narrower. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing writing, right? Like you're writing about who you are, but like, actually, yeah, who you, are, uh, right. you have your activities. But then, if you want to teach a course, like if you like graduate as like a, um, a neurophysiologist, mm -hmm. then you have to teach a course in anatomy and physiology. So I'm just wondering, like, how your career um, as a postdoc benefited or um, helped you? Yeah, okay. Well, so a couple things I'll comment on. And the first is that, you know, what you're, one of the things, you know, I've, I've described this narrow in a kind of pejorative way, like this is a bad thing. But this is actually, another word for this is expertise. To become an expert means to learn a tremendous amount, or in most cases means to learn a tremendous amount about a fairly narrow thing. And the reason for that is that simply the world is so complicated, science is so complicated, nature is so complicated, that to really understand any aspect of nature, you really have to focus on that aspect of nature and work and work and work and learn a lot about it. So, um, you know, if you're going to pursue an academic career, you're inevitably going to become more a more and more narrowly defined expert. And so that can that can that can live along with uh, acquiring a broader knowledge about a more, a more general knowledge, right? And, and in terms of but the, so so. I, I think that the expertise that I learned as a graduate student, postdoc, and researcher was valuable in, in the sense that, well, I know a lot about one thing, so that's really good. So if somebody comes up and asks me questions about voltage-gated sodium channels, in that case, I really do know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and so that's kind of a good thing. But um, also, you know, over the course of being a graduate student, a postdoc, and an academic, I had many opportunities to write grants and write papers and give talks and do all of those things. And all of those activities helped me develop uh, my skills as a communicator, right? And, and they helped me not only because I was doing these things, but because I was getting very intense feedback, right? If you write a grant and the grant's no good, it's not like you just wrote it and turned it in. I mean, you get all this feedback telling you why your grant's no good, right? And so, um, the, the practice of being 
an academic, I think it does help you to develop skills that are relevant to being a teacher, for example. But I, I, I do think that, you know, you know, for example, this course that you took with me, which is this neuroanatomy course, I mean, I'm not an expert in almost any of the things that I'm talking about in that course, right? Because we never talk about chain sodium channels in the course, right? Except pleading. Um, but I think that that's okay because, um, because it helps me, first of all, it helps me to appreciate that my students aren't experts either. And so they may find certain concepts difficult, right? So if I find a concept difficult and I'm struggling with it, then that probably means they're struggling with it too. And so that gives me a kind of empathy that I think is helpful as a teacher. And also for most kinds of teachings at, at most levels, uh, you, you actually don't, most students don't need real expertise. Most, most students engage in most topics at a level where they're not digging deep, deep, deep down into, into detailed expertise. And in fact, they don't really need to know that stuff at all. When I was a, when I was a, I, I, I was the director of one of the, I still am the director for one of the blocks, the medical students. And the, the block used to be, we changed the curriculum, but the block used to be, um, the first block that the students went into was basically five weeks of like an undergraduate degree in cell biology and molecular biology, just crammed into five weeks, right? And the idea was, well, all the students have to learn all this stuff about because you can't be a, a medical student, or you can't be a doctor unless you know all this stuff. And I would sit through these lectures and I would listen to these lectures come in and I would think to myself, they don't need to know any of this stuff. There was a the guy who came in and talked for like three days about lipid membranes, you know, and all these different phospholipids and all of this stuff. And I'm thinking, these people are going to be family doctors. They don't need to know this stuff. They need to know what a, they need to know what a cell membrane is, and they need to know the basic properties of the cell membrane, and they need to know the proteins are embedded in the cell membrane, and the membrane is you know uh, impermeant to charged ions and things like that. But they don't need to know all of this stuff. But the the teacher was an expert in lipid membranes, and he felt that they had he had to teach them all this, stuff, right? And so I I don't think that I think if you again if you think instead of thinking about what you know and what you want to tell people, if you think about what who your students are and what their needs are and what they're going to find difficult. And if you can appreciate and understand the things they're going to find difficult and the things that they're, the, th the, the knowledge that they're actually going to value, right? Because that's another thing I, I tell students all the time. I say, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them about something and I'll say, now here's the thing. This is the thing. You know, we talked about all this stuff but in three years, you're gonna have forgotten all that stuff. But here's the thing you need to remember. Here's the point of this you wanna remember, right? So when we talk about, we talk about myelination, right? And I go through the whole, the biophysics of myelination. And then I say, you know, none of you are gonna remember any of this stuff, but here's what you need to remember, that myelin speeds the propagation of action potentials. And that if the myelin is degraded because of multiple sclerosis or something like that, then action potentials don't propagate. That's, if you're a doctor, that's what you need to know. Or if you're a, most neuroscientists, that's all you need to know about mine, right? And so I think if you think a lot about, you know, what, do my, what, is, what information is actually valuable and meaningful to the people I'm teaching to, as opposed to, here's a whole bunch of stuff that I know. Let me tell you all the stuff that I know. Well, what do you, and then, and then what do you think about that? I think that that, I think that that's, um, that's what I think about as a teacher. And that's why I don't think, I think that being an expert on something and being an effective teacher aren't the same thing, but I think that they can cohabitate, they can live side by side with the same person. Actually, I got a PhD student that's what I struggle the most is um, knowing actually what's in the future, the knowledge that I need to acquire now and the expertise that they need to acquire now would be helpful to find me something that I wouldn't try doing in a teacher. And I struggle sometimes what I need to know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I think that that's a really good point. And of course, everything that I've said so far is all in retrospect, right? That's the problem. It's like you don't have the benefit of knowing what you're going to need to know in the future necessarily, especially in, in scientific fields where things change so fast and where the, the um, methodologies and techniques are changing so rapidly. It's hard to know what knowledge is actually going to be critical 
and valuable in the future. Yeah, there are some positions that they ask you a very specific expertise that you don't have that they don't want you, and there are some other people that require so many expertise in the field that okay, I don't have this or there. Yeah. yeah. I'm not hiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard to acquire these things because again, as a and 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 as a graduate student, if you got kind of channeled into some very narrow project where you learn one skill very, very well, but you don't learn a sort of broad, reasonably broad range of skills. Now you come out of this with this one very narrowly defined skill. Well, now you can be a really good postdoc, maybe, or a really good technician, but you're trying to develop yourself as an independent investigator or, or in some way have an independent identity. And if you're, you know, if your expertise is constantly channeled in narrow ways, you can become incredibly good. I mean, that's basically my, my situation. By the time I got done with my postdoc, I was a really good electrophysiologist and I wasn't very good at, at anything else, right? And I hadn't learned, I, I knew a little molecular biology, but not enough to call myself a molecular biologist. And so um, I felt that that was one of the constraints that I had. It's like I, I felt like I didn't have a broad enough set of skills. And there are some people who are just brilliant, right? So there are some people, um, you know, uh, who, who just say, well, now I need this new, this entirely new technique, technology to advance my work. And they just go and they learn how to do it. But those people are pretty special, I think. And, and uh, I wasn't I put myself in that category. So yeah, I agree with you. That's what that's a challenge. That's a problem. But that's the future. I don't know what the future is. You know, what's going to happen in the future? We have another question. Okay. Uh, they have lately changed their um, field from uh, biology to uh, human research. I wish they love it, but however they love it and they know they should learn, they are anxious about it from time to time. So their question is that how did you deal with this crisis feeling of Changing your field as you did in your PhD. What is your right? You mean so when I decided, okay, I'm going to focus on teaching as opposed to is that the crisis you're referring? No, the question is they have changed their field, right. like from biology to human research. Okay, so uh, they love it, but they are anxious about this big change, and they know you have done the same thing at your PhD. Like when you change, suddenly the big change happened for you, right. and they want to know how did you deal with this crisis. And this big change. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I, you know, uh, I, I guess I'd say two things. So, in, in terms of my personal experience as a PhD, I got an undergraduate degree in psychology. And then, um, you know, when I got into graduate school, I was suddenly doing research that was really, you know, um, molecular physiology or something like that. I'm not sure that's the right term. So, it was much different than what I was trained to do as an or, or what I learned, I wasn't trained to do anything as an undergrad, what I learned as an undergrad. At that time, I didn't see that as a crisis because I wasn't reflecting on it. I just was embracing it. I just said, well, now I'm doing something different and, uh, and, and this is wonderful and I'm excited about this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. But that, that's because I, I was naive, right? That's because I didn't think about it. So I understand this person's apprehension that they're switching, they're changing, and that kind of the ground underneath them now is unstable and it's a little bit scary. Um, but I, I think that you know my response is if this is what you're really interested in now and this is what you're passionate about now, then go for it and do it. You know, and and one thing I think, again, I don't mean to con be condescending towards you know people who towards students, but one of the things I think that. Um, because I'm talking, I've been talking to my daughter about this. So she's 25, right? My daughter's 25 now. And she's basically like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do if I don't have everything worked out by the time I'm 27? Everything's going to be, uh, you know, life's going to be all over. And, and I, I have to, I, I try to reassure her that she's got lots of time to figure things out and that she doesn't have to panic because, you know, because a decision that she's made has opened up the doors to uh, to something new and she doesn't know where that new thing is leading her. So it's okay. That's okay. There's plenty of time for you to find yourself and to work things out. So if you are doing something now, I would say to this person, if you're doing something now that you find interesting and exciting and that you feel good about doing, I wouldn't panic about the idea that, you know, this is something new and I don't exactly know where that's leading. I think that I, I would follow your 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 passions. 
and 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 there's plenty of time for that to work itself out. That's what I would say. So you recommend um, more active legal team for opportunities that have been placed in the past that you have already been in your statement. Yeah, I would say so. I'd say so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Beautiful. Good. So uh, a few, uh, as we come to a close, a few words of thanks. Um, first of all, to the University of Montreal for hosting us here in this beautiful space. And uh, Sarah Bellum for the support in many, many different parts of this endeavor. Uh, and uh, so growing up in Montreal is uh, made possible by a fabulous team, uh, Claire, uh, Amelia, uh, Heather, uh, Samane, and Beatrice. And in particular, uh, Samane, thank you so much for doing the tech support mm -hmm. today. That was super fluid mm -hmm. uh, the first time, but like it doesn't seem at all like the first time <laughs> mm -hmm. you're natural. So thank you so much for that. Um, please follow us if you're interested in this. We have a website. Uh, you can just reach it by Googling Growing Up in Science Montreal. Uh, this is a global initiative as well, hosted by uh, New York University, uh, Weiji Ma. Uh, and uh, you can find them by going to growingupinscience.com. I think yeah, dot com, not dot org, dot com, uh, and uh, they host uh, like a, a worldwide talks as well, which uh, you can follow often by streaming, uh, with some very interesting speakers there as well. So uh, with that, thank you all for joining here, both online and in person, and for your questions and your curiosities and your reflections. Uh, super rich, and of course, most of all, David, thank you so much for for being here and sharing your your experience and your your life your life wisdom with us. And uh, like you said, you were for a lot of things that you, you looking back, you would now like make more sense to you and you know, wish you'd had that, that information when you were younger. And I feel like these people are in that stage now. So thank you right. so much for well, sharing that. We love it. So with that, thank you so much. And uh, please join me in uh, uh, thanking David for, for his time here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.